Awesome. Um, slides are up on GitHub. You can get them now. Um, but you can just follow along with me because you know that's the fun, right? So what's in this presentation? A little bit about me, uh, an intro to SVG and Canvas, which are kind of core visualization technologies, and then live examples with some code. Me, that's a picture of me, just to prove something, I don't know. I've been making websites since 1997, so I knew all that table stuff, row spans, all that. That was me, too. Um, HTML, CSS, JavaScript that whole time, so I never did any Flash or any of those things. So I've seen kind of the dark side of doing this and then the awesome side that we live in now. So yay for awesome side. I'm on GitHub, Rob Larson. I tweet at two accounts. One, Rob Larson, www, where I talk just about technology. And Rob React, where I talk about everything but technology. I split them because I was driving my technology friends crazy, and I wanted to stop doing that. I have a blog at htmlcssjavascript.com, just in case you were wondering what it was I did. And I write books, so beginning HTML and CSS. And I have another one coming soon that I was hoping to announce here, but I can't. So you're just going to have to look at the big question mark and imagine something awesome. Somebody just tweeted at me. Oh, wait. That was a surprise slide. So I just found this out like two hours ago. I was a contractor. I had a contract. It was a great job. I found out two hours before I went on a presentation that I'm looking for a job. So I figured I'd throw this slide in last minute because, you know, the last thing I needed was, you know, uncertainty about whatever before I walked up here. But we're going to have fun. So. Oh, and I also do art. So that's some art I did. I'm at trunkofist.com and javaplus.com. If anybody knows what that's a reference to, you get a prize. I don't actually have a prize, but I'll like slap you five. If you don't know what it's a reference to, come find me later and I'll tell you. So what is data visualization? Anybody know who this, this guy is? There we go, Edward Tufte. Uh, he's like the kind of data visualization guru. He does these amazing presentations. You go, you sit, you watch them all day, you walk away, you want to do this stuff for the rest of your life. You come away with these books that are full of these beautiful visualizations. He's kind of the, the man for this stuff. So, and he's got uh, like a $35,000 book. He walks out at the end of this, his presentation. He's like, I have the, it's like the Principia Mathematica or something like that. And he walks around and shows you this magnificent book. I don't know. I don't know what the point of that is, but he does it. So, so but basically, what is, what is data visualization? It's taking data. It's so a last FM listening record from about a year and a half ago and turning it into something like this. This is a stream graph um, produced for a while at lastgraphairocode.org, and it re represents my listening history for a period of about um, three months or something like that. And you can actually watch as time goes on where like a new record comes out or I started listening to somebody that I hadn't listened to in 10 years and it's like it takes over your entire listening history. Um, it's just an interesting way to look at data. If you look at the raw JSON feed from Last.fm, there's really not much that you're going to learn from that. Whereas this, you can actually go back and say, wow, I was listening to a lot of NAS because I was, I don't know, I don't know why, but why not, right? Um, and certain times you can actually see like what, you know, when a new record came out and how it was the only thing you listened to for six months. So. So let's talk about some core visualization technologies. Um, just to give you kind of a primer on what you know, you'll be using, not all the time, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but the kind of stuff that the big heavy hitters for data visualization in the browser. Uh, the first one, and the one I, I prefer now, and this has changed over the last few years, but I really like working with SVG, and it's not just because it has that fancy logo, but it has a fancy logo. Um, SVG is funny, the specification came out in 2000, and it was basically ignored for 10 years, and then in like 2007, 8, 9, people started to treat it like a new thing, which was funny, because it was completely ignored. So what is it? SVG is vector graphics, so like Adobe Illustrator, uh, mixed up with XML, so it's an XML representation of vector graphics, um, much like peanut butter and chocolate, I don't know, I like that. Uh, when created in the context of an HTML document, which we'll see, um, SVG elements are just fancy DOM elements. So everything you know with some slight adjustments about 
manipulating and accessing properties of an HTML element, you can actually do with SVG, uh, which is one of the things that I like about it. It's easily, more easily translatable skill set um, from your average front end for your, for your average front end developer compared to Canvas, which you'll see in a second. I think it's great. Um, one of the other things that I like about it is that you can output, so I talked about Adobe Illustrator, you can actually output a .svg file from Adobe Illustrator and use it as a background image of a, uh, an HTML element, or you can use it as, a, as the source of a, an image tag, uh, which gives you great flexibility. Vector means it's scale. So this is one source scaled up from, I think, 15% to 200%. And you could scale this up to 5,000% and put it on the side of a building, and you wouldn't lose any fidelity. So if you're concerned about responsive images and that sort of thing, SVG actually solves all that stuff, because there's no bitmapped images that you have to worry about. It's the same file going down the pipe, the same file size, the same information that you can scale up or down as small as you need to, um, which is cool. There's the first bike image. That guy just won. Yeah. Here's an SVG element live and in the browser. That's amazing. So viewing source. So this is one embedded into the document as an element. So it's an SVG element. It's got a width. It's got a height. It's got a viewport tag, which defines the viewing box. Um, it's got an XML namespace, just because we have to be reminded that it's XML. And then there's a circle element in the inside of that SVG element. Center X, 100. Center Y, 100. Radius, 75. And you pass it a fill. Anybody know, recognize what that specific hex value is? It's the old uh, selected text pink from HTML5 boilerplate. It got taken out and replaced with something normal, so I always like to bring it back. So there it is in its glory. It can also look like this. This is the exact same visible thing. It's a circle. But it's, in this case, it's actually circle.svg inserted into the document. So just like you would any other image. Uh, this is a general support table. So as you can see, it's, there's a lot of green here. Uh, the biggest problems are old Android and old IE. Uh, you can actually get around old IE. Old Android is kind of a, a pain. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how you can get around old IE later. Data from can I use, which is awesome. Canvas. So Canvas is the other one. Canvas is one of the kind of early stars of the HTML5 era. It's a, an element, but it also has an associated 2D API, which allows you to draw um, images in this element. Whoa. Hey, now. Here's a canvas element. It looks suspiciously like the SVG circle. Viewing source. So the top is the canvas element. That's all you really have is just canvas element. It's empty. It's got an ID so you can reference it, height, width, kind of expected behavior there. And then below that, you have a little bit of JavaScript code which allows you to draw that image. So everything in Canvas starts with a context, uh, traditionally CTX or context or something like that, where you get a reference to the element, you get the 2D context, and then you do things to it. In this case, you begin a path, um, you draw an arc, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you set the fill style, you close the path, and then you fill it. So it's just a series of um, instructions that you give the browser to draw an image. It's a low-level API. So everyone knows that arc is all you need when you have math pi times 2, right? Everybody know? You would think there might be a circle. Well, there's not. So a lot of this stuff you have to do yourself. The cool thing about that is you have access to this stuff. You, uh, there, there's not a lot of getting in the way of what you're trying to do. The bad news is that there aren't a lot of conveniences. Um, and so the arguments there, by the way, are center x, center y, radius, start angle in radians. Show of hands, anybody knows what a radian is? It's not bad. Usually it's pretty empty. Uh, end angle in radians and clockwise as a boolean. So, um, not exactly, you know, context circle and you give it a radius and it's magic, but, you know, it is powerful, so we like that. General Canvas support, it's similar to the uh, uh, SVG and that old IE is, you know, probably your biggest desktop problem. So I think there's a problem with that. 
So comparing them, so there's a lot of questions that go around about which one should I use, and you know, Canvas is super popular, but now people are talking about SVG, and ah, how do I choose? At a high level, go SVG uh, when dealing with a limited number of elements, um, lower animation requirements, and higher interactivity needs. The last one is because you can use some of the things that you already know about interacting with elements when you're dealing with SVG. So if you look at something like Raphael or D3, um, the behaviors are very much like you, you would see you add events to an object that you know, is just naturally tracked in the browser. When you're doing stuff with Canvas, you have to have some sort of framework either written by yourself or um, that somebody else provides to kind of handle that interactivity stuff. Um, Canvas is much better for applications that require heavy duty animation um, and real time interaction and or many more elements. So SVG elements are DOM elements, so think about thousands of them and trying to manipulate that. Whereas um, in Canvas, it's only the one Canvas element and you're just programmatically managing what would be thousands of elements, but it's still just pixels. Um, so you get a little bit, benef little bit of benefit there. Now, this is a nuanced topic, so if you check out the slides, there are a couple of detailed articles that go through some of the things that I can't go through here. And generally, as you'll see, as we kind of go through this, use what works. So if you're doing data visualization, you don't necessarily have to fire up um, D3, or you don't have to do Canvas, and you don't have to do something you're unfamiliar with. If you're telling a story, and you're doing it with you know, just PNGs and CSS animations or whatever, that's fine. Uh, you have to identify the story you're trying to tell based on the data you have, and then assess the tools that are available to you. Um, and hopefully that'll come through as we look at this, because there's kind of varied approaches to this uh, problem as we go through. And so this is a, these are all, um, what follows are kind of code and samples that uh, some work I've done. And all of this is stuff that I've either done in production for clients or done in production for myself. Um, and so it kind of shows that I've solved this, you know, very small problem, like how do I take data and visualize, visualize it in an interesting way? And I've solved it in a few different ways with a few different tools, um, which allows, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll show you that you can do the same. Um, so this first one is Angular. You could use uh, pretty much anything that allows you to template and punch data into uh, your templates would work. I use Angular because I like it. Um, and it's magic. As I said, if Angular gives you hives, then squint to pretend it's something else and use Backbone or whatever you want. Uh, the thing I like about this demo is it shows you that SVG doesn't necessarily need to be wholly generated. So you don't need to fire up D3 and create uh, from whole cloth a visualization. This was actually output out of Illustrator, a viewed source, uh, plugged it into this HTML document, and then manipulated it with Angular, uh, much like you would do any sort of template. Um, so. This is kind of a powerful approach you can have designers do, you know, not that I'm a brilliant designer, but you could have somebody who is actually a brilliant designer do some work and then punch in uh, data and uh, interactivity as you needed with JavaScript. And so this is a table showing all of the, I told comics, right? All of the comic book sales over $100,000 between 1993 and 2013. And you can actually see, um, if you know this field, which I, for some reason, do, because I want extra nerd points all the time, you can actually see when interesting things happened, right? So around 2000, they started encapsulating comic books. CGC came out, and once they started encapsulating them, more people started to buy them, and the prices went up. So you can actually see a, a stack spike around 2000. And then uh, 2009, 2008, you can see the prices just skyrocketed because we started seeing prices over $500,000 and that proved to people that, wow, we can spend more money at this, which culminated in a $2 million sale a couple of years ago. Um, so this is, you know, I've kept this data for a long time and doing this kind of just scatter plot, which is actually relatively uh, simple, it's just time and, and value. Um, visualization, you, I was able to pinpoint where you could see these kind of explosion moments uh, where the market changed, um, which I thought was interesting because I'm a nerd. 
So uh, can't go into super, super depth on this. I've written this up, so if you look at the slides, you can actually go through and, and go to my blog where I've gone through line by line on this stuff. Um, but as you can see, this is just a, an SVG element. It's an Angular controller, but most of it is just kind of standard SVG. There's an SVG element. There are a bunch of lines, which, you know, the graph lines, I snipped out a bunch of them. There's some text, which is just a text element which in, with an X and Y. And then there's a very simple dynamic section down here um, where some Angular stuff happens. You repeat through this items collection, which is a collection of all the sales, and you place it on the graph based on the time or the value. Um, and there's a couple of Angular filters that I'm using, X, X date and Y price. They kind of take the raw um, price and time data and convert it into pixels based on the scale that I have. Um, and then there's a little t tool tip uh, that I didn't show you. There's two things that go on. So a little tool tip, and then you can filter these by venue. So you can see all the different venues that have sold these comics. So that's just done in a, another SVG element, because I decided to try and do everything in SVG in this. You could also, one of the nice things about this is that you can you know, blend in using just a div tooltip or some, you know, library that you like. I wanted to go all SVG because it's a fun demo. And so this is the actual JavaScript code. And as with Angular, a lot of times you'll see like, you know, most of the action kind of happens in the HTML slash SVG. And this is just updating the tooltip, which just updates some values that then show up. Um, and pick some colors for the, you know, the different color coordinated stuff. I mean, it's all very simple. Um, you know, if you know Angular, it's simple. If not, read the blog and you'll have an aha moment about how this stuff works. Uh, and these are the two filters. Now, this is one of the things that like kind of benefited me from doing this based on a design that I had, is that I didn't need to calculate a bunch of these things. If you're doing a generic scatter plot, you'd have to calculate, you'd need to take the range, you need to take the size of the element, you need to take all these things and kind of calculate out, uh, you know, what a dollar means uh, in terms of pixels. Um, or is this, I could actually measure them. So you see some kind of, you know, this uh, input here uh, is just a filter. I knew that that was, um, you know, a pixel equals $4,700. And so I could just do that. But you know, if you were doing it a generic one, you'd have to calculate that. But this is one of the benefits of being able to do it based on an image that you can control, is that you can kind of short circuit some of those things and just you know, measure it out. And this is just, uh, I just want to show this because in there it's a little data service that just grabs the data. It's actually just a plain old JavaScript object, which is one of the things I like about Angular, is that you just, you can deal with more complicated data kind of constructs, but a lot of times you're just grabbing an object and tweaking it. So D3, so D3, I've talked about D3 a little bit already. D3 is kind of one of the bigger libraries for doing visualizations. Um, and it is that whole cloth SVG visualization engine. Um, and one of the nice things about it, there's a lot of great examples and you know, probably some of the things that you've seen at maybe the New York Times or some of those places were done with D3. Um, and there are hundreds of examples online that you can tweak. And so this is the other end of the spectrum. This is using a tool that has kind of predefined uh, solutions and I've tweaked it just a little bit as opposed to doing a, an entirely custom visualization which I did with Angular. So this shows, um, we have a bike sharing program in Boston, it's called Hubway. They released uh, their data from their first 500,000 rides or something like that um, and said, hey, let's visualize this and, and figure out interesting things about what we're doing. And so two of the visualizations I have here are based on that data. Um, this one shows the top 10 departure stations and how many people go from one of those top 10 departure stations to another one. So the 10 most popular stations, how many times people ride in between them. Um, and so Stouse Station, which is our big train station downtown, is the most popular, um, something nearly 20,000 rides. Um, and you can see that actually a lot of people, this number right here is actually people going from South Station and returning the bike back to South Station. 
Um, but you can also see like, you know, a lot of people are going from, Her you know, from South Station to Hereford Street. And if you know about Boston, you know about the bicycling infrastructure there. Some of this stuff is actually interesting to take a look at. And we'll look at it in a different way later. Um, so the big thing about this is basically just like getting the data that I had and putting it into this matrix. So this is an array of arrays. Um, and you read, in looking at it like this, you read this column is South Station, this column is South Station, and that's the interconnectedness. So basically the whole, not the whole work I had to do on this, but the biggest part of the work I had to do on this was just manipulating my data until it was in this matrix. And then it just, you spit it in, you just plugged it in, changed the colors, D3 does its magic based on one of the examples that's out there. Super powerful. So one of the things I did have to do is the original variation had, didn't have these horizontal um, labels. It had these uh, kind of starburst labels that went out at an angle. So I rewrote that. But really, if you were just looking to get this out for, you know, some sort of presentation or whatever, you could go with the default because it's still very nice. And um, you know, you'd be in and out as long as it, you could get your data into that format. And so I definitely can't go through the whole of this because there's a lot that goes on. But a lot, I mean, the basic pattern is you create a D3 uh, object and you manipulate it. It's chaining. It should look very familiar to kind of the jQuery type patterns. Uh, a lot of the method names are the same and things like that. Um, and it's really just a matter of, I mean, for most people, it's just a matter of identifying like, where the thing you need to tweak happens and then figuring out how to do it. Um, so the, most of this is based on the example that was posted here um, at the top at bl.ocks.org. Um, and then I just had to tweak one section here, which is where uh, you go into the SVG, uh, you go into the SVG, you append a bunch of, a bunch of um, you create a group, you a bunch of append a bunch of SVG text elements, and then just you know, apply some transforms to get them to the X and Y that you want. Um, so that was the only real customization that I needed to do, but then I made it uh, what I needed it to be. And so this is a great way to approach D3, is that you can get very far without having to know a bunch about this. If you know a little trig, you can do your own customizations that really, you know, it's a really powerful tool in that perspective. Canvas. So Canvas, as I said, allows you to draw 2D pictures in a box on the page. Well, what can you do with that? And I said it was good for real-time stuff. So anybody know about the web audio API? Not like playing MP3s, but there's actually like tweaking audio stuff. Chris Wilson does a lot about it. I don't know. It's cool stuff. Um, I'm not an expert, but I have played around with it a little bit and come up with this. play it all, but we don't have time. Um, spectrum analysis, real-time analysis of the data coming out of that MP3 file. So the core of that actually happens in the audio realm. If you go again, look at the source, you can take a look at how that happens, but the canvas is actually very simple. It's just filling a rectangle. You just take the canvas element and you're just filling a rectangle that represents, you know, some portion of that spectrum and you fill it with a uh, gradient, and you get this kind of fancy visualization. Um, it's, you know, 10 lines to do that. Um, and you have to know a little bit about it, but it's actually kind of cool that you can, you know, take that information in real time without really optimizing it, really worrying about performance and all of those kind of things, and getting a real-time analysis of an MP3 that I just grabbed off of the internets. Um, Google Maps. This is the last one, and this is really not a visualization technology at all. It's maps. But you can take, uh, there's a lot of ways that you can take data and visualize it on a map. 
people are already thinking, I mean, at the end of the day, a map is a visualization of the world as we see it. Um, and so you can take data and map it, layer it on top of a map and get new insights. And so this one, um, let's just go to the visualization. So this is again that Hubway data. And so what I did here, this will run for a minute and I'll talk about it while it goes. So I took that interconnection between the 10 most popular stations and the 10 destination stations. And I did, I'm doing a lookup with the Google Maps directions API to get bicycling directions between each of the stations. I'm then applying a, uh, a color for the different station, the departure stations, um, and a scale for the number of rides that happen between those two stations. The goal of this is to look at the map when it's done and be able to identify where bicycling infrastructure might fall apart, right? So if you actually look downtown where I work, people are going around the peninsula to get from one end to the other because riding a bicycle through the center of the peninsula is like you're taking your life in your hands. And you can very clearly see the 20, 30, 30,000 trips are happening, are going two times out of their way to avoid the center of the city. Um, and so this was an interesting thing for me to do to kind of map out um, and identify some things that I kind of knew, but you could see where, well, Google says this is the safest bicycling route, but it's an absolutely terrible. Uh, it, take, it will take you 20 times longer than it should, or 20 minutes longer than it should if you're going as the crow flies. So. I'm going to skip over the rest because it depends on network. Um, most of this is actually just Google Maps stuff. Again, I wrote this up in detail, so if you look at the slides, any of, all of these visualizations have a, an associated write-up where you can look at how the implementation details. Um, and a lot of this is really just like thinking of it. This is an example of like where you're using existing tools and you just kind of have to think of an angle uh, on how to approach, you know, getting it onto the screen. And really all I had to do was think of, well, I could use the cycling directions, I could use the width of the lines, and I could use color to, you know, map on top of um, the existing map data to kind of see where bicycling infrastructure falls apart in Boston. And there, it's getting better, but there's still a lot of places where it does fall apart. Um, so there's a couple of resource slides. Uh, other libraries here, Raphael, which was kind of the library that kicked started SVG from being and also ran to being, you know, something that people pay attention to. Snap SVG, which is the guy that wrote Raphael, has gone on to write Snap SVG, which is a modern uh, SVG library. Uh, SVG JS and uh, Polymaps are a couple of others that I've, I've found interesting. There are a bunch of Canvas libraries. Um, a lot of them are going to be very specific to the thing that you're going to do. So if you're looking at one of these things and you want to do charting in Canvas, you should probably Google charting Canvas. Whereas Snap and Raphael are very much kind of generic Canvas tools. I mean, generic SVG tools. Anybody know Columbo? Anybody? Yeah, all right, cool. So Columbo, he was a detective. He would, uh, he would, he was kind of a schlub. He would come out, he would ask really benign questions, and the, the, the guilty party would think they'd gotten one over on Columbo. And Columbo would walk off, and then he would turn around right as he got to the door, and he'd say, just, just one more thing. I love that, Columbo. And this is my Columbo moment. There's an absolutely phenomenal uh, resource called datavisualization.ch, um, which lists a, even more tools in more languages than just JavaScript, so R or Python or whatever. So if you're at all interested in this stuff, I suggest you check this site out, because um, it's very cool.